Welcome back everyone to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 at Southern Utah University. As usual, I am your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, this part of our series is lecture 36, uh, which we entitle Curve Sketching. Uh, the examples from this lecture are derived from uh, examples from Calculus by James Stewart. In particular, these examples are coming from section 4.5, Summary of Curve Sketching. So what do we mean by curve sketchy? It sounds a little sketchy to me, right? I'm sorry, it's a horrible pun, but I have to try it anyways. So based upon what we've learned over the last couple lectures here in our, in our chapter four uh, of Stewart's calculus here, we've been learning about applications of the derivative. In particular, as we've been talking about L'Hopital's rule, uh, extrema, max and mens, and how the first and second derivative affect the shape of the graph, we want to put all of these together uh, and see exactly why does a function's graph look the way it does. Turns out the algebraic formula that gives us the function says so much about it. It's not just some random string of points. Uh, the behavior of the function indicates how this graph is going to be shaped here. So if we follow along with the same um, suggestions that Stewart offers in his, calcul his calculus textbook, we have a list of things, A through E, that go into a good curve sketch. So how does one sketch the graph of a function F, all right? So the first on our list is the idea of domain. We should know what the domain of the function is. Uh, and so the domain, remember, these are going to be all of the possible X coordinates. And you'll apologize for my horrible handwriting, but, you know, it's what happens here. So we want to figure out all the possible x-coordinates that go onto the graph. And by the domain convention that we've talked about previously, we're going to assume the domain is as large as possible, meaning that we accept all possible x's such that the formula makes sense uh, for those real numbers x. Now, there might be some situations, like we have a piecewise function, or, or we might specify the domain otherwise, but unless otherwise stated, we assume it to be as big as possible. So some things we have to watch out for. Uh, we don't want to divide by zero, right? When we have a rational expression of some kind, if you divide by zero, this typically gives us some type of vertical asymptote. Uh, we'll talk about these a little bit more in a little bit, uh, but vertical asymptotes often happen from division by zero. Um, we have to look out for like square roots of a negative. Uh, this will give us imaginary numbers. Likewise, if we take the log of a negative, same basic problem. But I should also mention that the natural log of zero or any log of zero is going to be undefined. Uh, so there are, these are the three main problems we have to work at, look out for. Division by zero, uh, square roots of a negative. And of course, when we talk about a square root, it's really just e any even root, right? If you take a fourth root of negative one, that's equally a problem. Uh, so we want to make sure we avoid even radicals of negatives. And any logarithm of a negative or zero is also problematic. Now, admittedly, the, the trigonometric functions have some restrictions on the domains, like tangent, secant. Uh, but if you view those as quotients, uh, they apply by the divide, division by zero rule applies there. So I'm not going to make much effort about that. Um, the, R, uh, the inverse trigonometric functions also have some restrictions, but we'll be honest. Uh, we're not going to be graphing those functions, so I'm not going to pay much more attention to them. So look out for the domain of these things. The range, on the other hand, uh, like all the set of all possible y-coordinates, that's a much harder question to answer. And in fact, by curve sketching, we'll actually learn very well how to identify the range of a function. Uh, but I would recommend start off with identifying the domain of these things. Um, the x or the intercepts, excuse me, <coughs> part b. Intercepts are an important part of the, any graph because the intercepts tell us where does the graph touch the x-axis or the y-axis if it touches at all. We're going to use the x and y-axis to give us frame of reference as we're graphing these things, so it's nice to know they're intercepts. A, a y-intercept is pretty easy to come by. If you want to find the y-intercept, you just have to look at the point f of 0 and then compute the corresponding y-intercept, or the y-intercept will be just f of 0. Um, that's how you find it. So those are you'll be pretty pretty straightforward. Your graph will have one y-intercept, except for if f of zero is undefined. It could be that x equals zero is outside the domain. X-intercepts are a little bit more challenging. Uh, 
because uh, one, there could be multiple X intercepts. And to find X intercepts, we have to, we actually have to solve the equation f of x equals zero. And that could be more challenging depending on the nature of the function. Like if f is a polynomial function, like we'll see in a little bit, we might have to factor it. Uh, we might have to use other algebraic tools to help us there. And so finding the x-intercepts will be important for us, but this, this, this is one of the harder parts of the problem, finding the x-intercepts. There could be lots of x-intercepts. There could be one, there could be none. It depends on the function. And we'll see some examples to show you how that works. Uh, the notion of symmetry. Hmm. Well, what do we mean by symmetry here? Well, there, there's a couple of different types of symmetry we've talked about this semester already. So one of the types of symmetry we've talked about is the idea of even symmetry. Uh, when your function is, we'll say, symmetric with respect to the y-axis. That is, if we reflect the graph across the y-axis, uh, we get the exact same thing again. This is the geometric interpretation of symmetry along the y-axis. I mean, what an even function is. Algebraically, we can find out this symmetry by looking at f of negative x. Because algebraically, if we replace x with negative x, we get a reflection across the y-axis. If the function's even, uh, this should then look just like f of x. That is, it's unaffected by that change. Uh, going hand in hand with even symmetry, there's the notion of odd symmetry. Uh, odd symmetry is when you are symmetric with respect to the origin, right? Uh, origin symmetry meaning that if you were to go through the origin, uh, you would come out the exact same distance of the side. Or another way I like to think of it is if you were to rotate the function around the origin 180 degrees, a half spin, uh, this gives you the same graph again. Uh, algebraically, we can test for symmetry by looking again at f of negative x, and we get negative f of x, like so. And so the idea here is that if you were to reflect the graph across the y-axis, that's the same thing as reflecting it across the x-axis. Now, when it comes to these two types of symmetries, there's a simple test that we do to do for symmetry. You look at f of, f of negative x. And so you look at f of negative x. If it turns out f of negative x simplifies just to be f of x, you're even. Um, if it simplifies to be negative f of x, then you're odd. And if neither of those things happens, well, then neither of these two symmetries are exhibited on the function. Now, I should mention there is one other type of symmetry that uh, is mentioned here. The idea of your periodic. So it could be that you have a function which, if you take the function f of x and you add some period p to it, it might repeat itself after a while. Uh, the idea is like with trig functions, if you take sine of x plus 2 pi, then this thing is just repeats itself. In fact, adding 2 pi to the, to the angle doesn't make any bit of difference to it whatsoever. So trig functions are periodic, and um, those are the types of periodic behavior that we'll be really interested with with the trigonometric functions. There's really not going to be other type of periodic functions we have here, but that is a type of symmetry I would like to mention. Because after all, if you know how to graph one period of a trigonometric function, you can just replicate that over and over and over again, and that gives you the whole picture. So knowing the, knowing the period of a function, if it has one, can be helpful in simplifying the graph here. And that's kind of the reason why we care about uh, symmetry in general, is that if we know the function is symmetric of any kind. If it's an even function, then I can just take the right-hand side of the graph and copy it, and that gives me the whole graph. So I basically only have to graph half of it. And if the function's odd, same basic thing, you have to rotate it, but if you can graph the right side of the graph, you get the left side for free. So this can be useful when you're graphing, but honestly, symmetry, in my opinion, doesn't play too much of a benefit as we curve sketch here. Again, it's useful. It is. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but if you don't put a lot of emphasis on symmetry, I'll be okay with that. Uh, I'm just kind of following uh, James Stewart's list here. But again, I, I, do, I do recommend symmetry. It's good, uh, but it's not the most important thing. Um, discontinuities is going to be a pretty important thing for us. I, that I can't emphasize here, that if your graph has any type of discontinuities of some kind to it, I want to see that as you draw your, your, your graph of the function there. And we've learned in the past a couple different types of discontinuities. And so there are, there's three discontinuities that I want you to be looking for uh, as you're drawing your functions here. So the first kind, if you remember, was what we called the removable discontinuities. 
And so visually, this off this, this was the case that there was like a point missing on the graph. Some hobbit stole it from us, right? And so it could be that the point's just missing, or maybe it got moved to be somewhere else. There's a couple of ways this this basically these are one of the two pictures you get. Either the point was removed or it's just missing in general. Uh, this happens when the limit of our function um, it exists. But for whatever reason, it doesn't equal the function at that value. I guess I should probably add a limit here as x approaches a. The limit exists, but it doesn't equal f of a. And that could be because either f of a is a different number, or it could be that f of a is just missing entirely. Someone might, again, have moved it, so there's no point there at all. And so these are, this is a removable discontinuity. That's that, Those are sort of the most benign type of discontinuities. But if your graph has any of those, we want to see them. All right. What was the second type of discontinuities? Uh, the second type is what we call a jump discontinuity. Jump of some kind. And so maybe your function was coming along, and then it just jumped maybe because it's defined as a piecewise function. And so there actually might be this gap that lives between the function. Uh, this You're going to get a jump discontinuity because with your function, as you're approaching, say, x equals a, if you come from the left-hand side, this might disagree with the limit from the right-hand side. And so this is what we have. Uh, this is when we get a jump discontinuity. If our graph has one, I want to see it as you're graphing it. All right, and so I'm trying to kind of erase things to keep everything organized here. By all means, if I'm going too fast, please pause the video um, and copy things down if you need it for your notes here. Uh, the last type of discontinuity that I kind of mentioned earlier, but the idea of a vertical asymptote. This is a long word, isn't it? Vertical asymptote. Uh, the vertical asymptote, the idea behind that is we might have some vertical line that our function is avoiding for whatever reason. Uh, maybe you get something like this going on, something like this. Probably because this line is outside the domain, although that's not always required. And so our functions can be avoiding it as it goes. It's going to be going off towards infinity or negative infinity. So a vertical asymptote occurs whenever x approaches a from the left or right, f of x here, we get plus or minus infinity. Now, it doesn't have to be that both the left limits and the right limit are, are infinite, but we just we need something like this for a vertical asymptote to occur. And so these are the three types of discontinuities uh, that we are looking out for. Jump discontinuities, removal discontinuities, and these vertical asymptotes. All right. Uh, so in behavior, what do we mean by this? Uh, in behavior, we're trying to figure out what does the function do as it goes to the extremes, as it goes to the extreme of its domain. Which oftentimes will oftentimes that'll be negative infinity or positive infinity. And so like with a polynomial, is it going up on the right hand side? Is it going up on the left hand side? Maybe it goes up on the right hand side, but down on the left hand side. These are the type of questions we're trying to ask ourselves. So what's the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity? Right, what is that? That's what we mean by end behavior here. Now, oftentimes, this might be plus or minus infinity itself, or it might be a finite number. Um, if this limit turns out to be finite, that's because we have a horizontal asymptote. And so if that asymptote exists, include that on the graph as well. Now, another issue that does come up here is if what if your domain's not uh, negative infinity to positive infinity? Like if you took, for example, the natural log, y equals the natural log here, its domain is actually zero to infinity, in which case we do care what happens as x approaches infinity. But on the other hand, we the left-hand side, we actually care what happens as you approach zero from the right. And so in behavior depends on the function. Um, as you go to the extremes, wh what's happening to our function? We want to make sure we put that on our graph as well. All right, what does the first derivative have to do with with graphing a function. Well, as we've seen before, whenever your first derivative is positive, this is exactly when your function is increasing. And when your second or when your first derivative is negative, this is exactly when your function is decreasing. And so this type of monotonic behavior is essential to know as we graph our functions. And we also want to keep our eye out for extrema, right? Do we have a local maximum, a local minimum? 
we should put those on the graph if they're there. Extrema will be something I absolutely look for on graphs. Just make sure you have the appropriate extrema there. Um, we can say similar things with the second derivative, right? Because with the second derivative, if it's positive, this means your graph is concave upward. Uh, if your second derivative is negative, that means your graph is concave downward. And lastly, I'll be interested in those points of inflection. And we'll see some examples where we go through all of these in just a second. Points of inflection, we're going to care about those. And so we'll, we'll see some sign charts to handle all of those. And so in the end, once you have all this information, I want you to plot this stuff on, on some grid some grid lines here. So if there's intercepts, plot them. If there's critical numbers, uh, inflections, put those on there. In behavior, draw it. Uh, what else do we have on our list? Discontinues, put them there. So plot all the points. And then the very last step is one of the most critical steps because the function otherwise, except for those points that you've looked at, is going to be smooth and continuous. You can smoothly connect the dots. Uh, I know it sounds like a kindergarten skill, but it turns out kindergarten is our college level mathematics, right? We have to appropriately connect the dots here. And so these steps will help us as we try to sketch a curve here.